Hello, story lovers. I'm Laurel McCarg, and you're visiting Alligator Preserves. In today's episode, you're going to meet Sarilyn Richard, author of the book Murder in the One Percent. Don't go away. Sarah Lynn, welcome. Welcome to Alligator Preserves. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful to have you on. What I typically do with authors is, oh, well, with lots of my guests, is I have you introduce yourself because I think you can do it better than anyone else. Would you introduce yourself to our audience? I'd be glad to, Laurel. Um, I'm a former educator and a current educator. I still teach creative writing and a literature course, but I've always been passionate about writing. And I've put that on the back burner while I had a different career, but now it's on the front burner. So I started off with writing a children's book after uh, my dog, Nana. And she's an old English sheepdog that was the naughtiest puppy that ever lived. So the book is called Naughty Nana, and that was my first published book, and it has done extremely well. It's in seven countries, and it's in its second printing. So after I uh, put out Naughty Nana, I joined a writer's critique group, and I had to give them something to critique. So I have had probably a thousand story ideas in my head over all the years that I've been collecting. And one of them was this story uh, that takes place, it's a locked room mystery, it takes place in Brandywine Valley, Pennsylvania, which is really bucolic and gorgeous and just has natural beauty. And it's, it's a very wealthy area of the country and you would never expect a murder to take place there. So I thought that's the book that I want to give them. And, and that's the book that I wrote, Murder in the 1%. Oh, my goodness. Do you have a copy of Naughty Nana, Naughty Nana that you can hold up? I do. Let's see that. Oh, my gosh. That's Naughty adorable. Nana. And it's funny because when I saw the title Naughty Nana, in my family, we call grandparents Nana. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, oh, this is going to be kind of a, a sexy old lady book. <laughs> Yay, boy. If you Google Naughty Nana, there are a couple of other books with the title, and they are, one of them is Naughty Nana's Knickers. Oh, my. Oh, my. Maybe not a children's book? But we have a lot of Nana, grandmother Nanas, that buy this book and like to read it to their grandchildren. I think so, that's hilarious. Yes, it's really been a fun adventure. Oh, that's funny. So when did you know that you had to write? Go back to maybe the first thing that you wrote that you knew was good or that you got some kind of approval on. I, I started writing when I was very young, like maybe second grade. Hmm. And when I got to high school, I had two teachers that really like identified me as a potential writer and really pushed me and encouraged me to write. One of those teachers is still alive and we're in contact and she's just so thrilled that, I've, that I'm finally doing what I wanted to do all my life. Um, the other one made me enter contests. And so those were assignments. I had to enter these contests my senior year in high school and every single contest that I entered, I won. Wow. And I don't think it was my writing. I think it's that seniors in high school are too lazy to enter the contest. So you were like so the only, only one the entering. only one entering. No, I but, don't think so. But all of that really gave me the confidence that I could write and that I should write. But my parents convinced me to put that on the back burner until after I had a more conventional career. I, I think parents have a tendency to do that, right? Parents want their children to be able to support themselves. And we know that it's a very challenging and competitive world out there for anything creative, be it writing, art, theater, any of, any of those creative mm -hmm. endeavors. Oh, my goodness. So when did you start writing in earnest? When did you tell yourself... I'm an author. 
Well, during the time that I was a teacher and a, a school administrator, I wrote kind of on the side. Um, but I never really, and, and I started a novel, and I never really had the, the time that I could sustain time, that I could keep going with the novel. So every time I would get some time to sit down, I'd have to go back and read what I had written and that took up all my time eventually. So I just stopped doing that and I started writing some short stories and some essays. And, and I did, um, in my work, I did a lot of curriculum writing and technical writing. So I was always writing. I was always putting words on paper and publishing those words. Um, and I've edited a few books. So I've, I've had my hand in the career all of these years. Um, but now I really decided that it's now or never. So this is the time of my life that I have the luxury of devoting my time to this endeavor. And, and it's very exciting for me. There's no part of it that I don't love, which I can't say for all of my author friends, a lot of them complain about the marketing or they complain about the editing in front of the public and things like that. I love it all. It, it's just all dream fulfillment for me. So it's a but, joy. Well, it certainly comes out in your book. We are visiting with Sarah Lynn Richard, author of Murder in the 1%. Now, I have to ask you this and this is maybe kind of a weird question, but you have so many wonderful reviews on your book on Amazon. Have you received any hate mail from one percenters? Or, or I I'll have, just say it, hate mail. I haven't received hate mail from one percenters. I think they're much too, um, Uh, they keep their distance. They, they wouldn't express that emotion publicly, I don't think. But I have heard that some of them were very uncomfortable, made very uncomfortable by the book. But others really loved the book and thought that it was right on. And I had a number of real life resource people who gave me because obviously I'm not in the 1%. So I had to do research to make this authentic. And so I had quite a few uh, sources who are one percenters and they really love the book. So, well, that's good to know. In an interview uh, in the Hunt magazine back in April of 2018, you mentioned that this book, Murder in the 1%, was inspired by an actual dinner party. I would like to hear about that dinner party and was there perhaps someone there someone might have wanted to bump off? <laughs> the dinner party was in the actual house that's in the book. Oh, it's and and we actually had a launch party for the book in that house. So that was pretty cool. Um and it was a weekend retreat which is very typical out there because you're remote, you're far away, you're outside of Philadelphia about an hour. Mm -hmm. You're far away from a hotel or restaurants. So if, if you have company, you have them spend the night and stay for the weekend usually. So that's the kind of party it was and we were lucky enough to be on the guest list. And in that Saturday night dinner, we had a nine course meal with wine pairings, just like the menu in Murder in the 1%. Oh. And, and it did last until two o'clock in the morning. It was a, just a fantastic, phenomenal party. And afterwards we were sitting in the family room and I turned to the woman next to me and said, you know, this would make a great setting for a murder mystery. And she nearly fell off of her chair. And I said, but for that to happen, one of us would have to die and one of us would have to be a killer. But other than that, it would just be perfect. Did you know this and, woman beforehand? Yes, yes. 
And uh, she said, if you write the book, I'll give you a launch party at my house. And I said, okay, that's a deal. And I did, and she did. Um, but what struck me about it was that that's the last place you would expect murder to take place. And because it was so remote and it was snowing outside and, you know, all the guests are like huddled together in this house, there's nobody coming in and there's nobody leaving. So the suspects have to be among the guest list. And that's what make, made it kind of a challenge to write and also intriguing to write. I had a lot of fun writing this book. Well, I, I could tell reading it. I absolutely could tell reading it because it's a really fun read. You have so many characters in this book, including maids and butlers. And so, of course, you're like, the butler did it. You know, the maid did it. You start questioning absolutely everyone. And you have Andrea the crime writer, which I thought was hilarious because here you are writing a crime writer and you have a crime writer in your story. Brilliant, loved it. And of course you, you're thinking of everybody as you read because you know it's a murder mystery right up at the front. And so immediately you, you as a reader start suspecting everyone. How did you keep track of all your characters? <laughs> When I first started out, there were two more characters. Oh, there was another couple there. And uh, my writer's group said, you've got too many characters for us to keep track of. So I cut that couple out and gave some of their characteristics to the remaining couples. Um, but I, I don't outline my books, but I do outline my characters. And so I had a character sheet for each of the characters and how they related to Preston, who is the victim. The, the bumpy. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and he's, he's kind of the centerpiece of, of that group. Like everybody kind of revolves around him, not because they want to, but because they have to. And, um, so I had, I had a character chart and I had all of their physical characteristics on it, as well as their past history with Preston and, you know, other details about them that made them different from each other. And I needed that because I didn't want to have a character show up on page 200 with green eyes, who was on page 54 with gray eyes. So I, I had to constantly refer to that chart. But once I had that, the book really wrote itself because those characters acted out just right in front of my eyes. They acted out the story. And the, for example, there's a horse, horseback chapter, horseback riding chapter. And when I sat down to write that chapter, um, I had no idea that a, a specific incident was going to happen. I was, I was going to get to that a little bit later. I was going to get to that question, but my we, characters ran away with the story. And yeah. so the incident happened and I don't want to spoil it for readers, but this incident happened that really was necessary for the rest of the plot of the book. It, it became an alibi. It became a, a motivation. It, it became a, a place setter like the character had to stay in a certain place instead of another place so it was a keynote event but i hadn't planned it my characters just made it happen i think that's awesome you talk about your characters and wanting to make them different is your character chart is it a paper is it eight by eleven paper that you have spread out all on a table or do you have something compact how do you physically keep keep that visual. Mm -hmm. It was eight, eight and a half by 11 paper. For it, each. It was like a graphic organizer and with bubbles for each character. Okay. All right. And tiny writing. T teeny tiny <laughs> writing. Right. I, I have to compliment you on your ability to describe your characters so uniquely and, and I'll say surprisingly. Yeah. One, one line, you talk about Kitty, 
in the name, Kitty, revealing cleavage, impossibly suntanned for the season. You, you don't do the, he was five foot 10, balding, you know, big nose, uh, beer belly gut. You, you don't do that type of description on any of your characters. Your descriptions are all surprising and fun and enjoyable to read. They're humorous. So how, how challenging was it to create so many? And again, you got, what, 16 characters mm -hmm. plus maids and, and butlers? Mm -hmm. How did you craft so many different personalities and keep them playing with the stereotypes? Because you obviously played with stereotypes, but you still were able to make them beyond stereotype and unique. How did you do that? I think part of the... the um secret to it is that they were very real to me and my husband who was my first reader and and i would sit and talk about these characters at dinner or if we're driving in a car and and we would talk about them like they were real people and i would dream about them at night and i would think about them when i first woke up i would think about them while i was exercising they were just always on my mind and really real people. And even to this day, we will have a conversation. I'll say that's a Preston kind of guy, or that's a Margot kind of girl. And it, they just are very real to me. And that's how their characteristics emerged. It, it's just, that's how they came to me. They had to be real. D did you use real people though? For some uh, of the, the people who were at the original party have all been try scrambling to try to figure out who's who. And, and none of them are really the real people. Um, there, there are a few little composites because those people are in the finance industry, just like the characters. So there are a couple of allusions to relationships that they might have, but there's no one character that you could say this one is this person and this one is that person. Um, the, the host of the party, I had to ask those people, the couple, if it's okay if I write this book, because I didn't want to write it and then have them tell me, oh no, you can't publish that book. So I got their permission, but they said, you know, they were all too happy to give me permission, but they didn't want me to make them look bad. So, and then that's pretty much everybody that I spoke with. They would give me any information I wanted as long as don't make me look bad, don't make me the killer, don't make me the victim. Um, but otherwise, very cooperative and forthcoming with information. Don't make me the killer. Yeah. Did you know who done it from the beginning when you first started writing it? Yes and no. Yes and no. Oh, thanks. I, I did have an idea that that's how, that's who I wanted to do it. But I changed my mind a few times when I was writing it because I was so drawn into the compelling reasons that so many people had to kill Preston. And as I'm writing about those people, I'm like, oh yeah, this one could, could have done it for sure. And then I'd write about the next one. Oh yeah, this one definitely could have done it also. So I, I have to say that I changed my mind a few times, but I, but I always had that person in mind. All right. You write this in third person omniscient, omniscient perspective. Many people say it can't be done well. You did it really well. And how did you come to that decision that you had to do it that way? Because there were so many characters and each of those characters had to, we had to go into their thoughts. Um, there was no way I could tell this particular story from just one viewpoint or two viewpoints. There, this was a story with an ensemble cast of characters. And 
every character had to have his moment or moments. And so I had to make it somewhat omniscient, but I also tried to be in a single point of view, mostly parents point of view, um, when I could. But like when they're sitting at the dinner table and there's this dinner conversation going on, there's a subtext to all this dinner conversation. And it, it was a real challenge to work in the subtext without changing point of view. You had, you had to do it. And I would say that being able to express the internal monologue going on in each character's mind gave them, uh, it, it relieved them from suspicion. You, you suspect every single person going through, right? I mean, you did that beautifully. <laughs> but then you'd, you'd read an internal monologue. It's like, oh, they couldn't have done it. I did that with every single character. So I think that was brilliant. I think you did it well, and it was not confusing at all. Some people say third person omniscient can be confusing if you're, they call it um, head jumping or whatever. Head hopping. Head hopping. Yeah. I, I didn't feel like there was head hopping going on because I just knew that whose head I was in each time. And it was, it was very clear. So thank you. Well done. That's a wonderful compliment. Because that's something that really worried me. Yeah, no, it was it was great. Talk about, and this is fun. I thought it was funny and fun. Talk about your naming conventions. You've got Detective Parrot, who has a cockatiel named Horace, which just made me laugh. You have a character, the, the host's name, it's his birthday, John E, capital E. And of course, you read that Johnny. Why John E? Why did you, why did you do that? Tell me about mm -hmm. some of the other naming, mm -hmm. how you came up with names. Well, they're all different. You know, there's all different reasons for naming characters. Um, Parrot is an African-American, and he is a young college graduate, football hero, eager to make a name for himself. Uh, very well educated, ambitious, and he has a very strong moral compass. And I wanted to give him a name uh, that would fit a good detective. And I, I actually know someone from my teaching who kind of reminds me of Parrot, and his name is Parrot. So that's that's how I came to to Parrot's name. Um, but it is also a nod to Hercule Poirot, who is Agatha Christie's detective. Ah, deeper levels. I just thought it was funny that he had a bird. No, but that parrot, that's how I got to parrot, is because of Poirot and the parrot that I know. Uh, the reason he has a bird is I wanted to give him a pet, but he is on the move so much. He lives alone and he couldn't have a dog because he couldn't possibly take care of his dog. He's traveling back and forth to New York and um, staying up late working on this case. And so I had to give him a more uh, low maintenance pet. So that's how I came to the bird. And I thought it was perfect because parrot is a bird name and he has a bird. And I didn't want to give him a parrot. So I gave him a cockatiel and Horace, is a you know Horace is a uh, Latin writer, um, so I wanted to show that Parrot is very well educated, and would have picked somebody from the classics to name his bird after. So that's how I got to that name. And John E. Um, I have a very dear friend that I worked with who was named John E. And we all called him John E and it sounded like Johnny. And uh, he passed away, and I just kind of wanted to honor his memory by naming my character after him. I will say, though, that it, it was difficult. I don't think I'll do that again with an initial, because when you go to do the possessive, John E's, at such and such, 
punctuating it is difficult and you know I, I will probably avoid doing that again but it did kind of tie in with the one percenter kind of name right we're, we're going to say his initial mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the same thing his wife's name is caroline but they call her caro mm -hmm. and and that's just kind of i thought sort of a patrician nickname I, I, you had fun with names. I know you did. We are visiting with Sarah Lynn Richard, author of Murder in the One Percent, a murder mystery, if you haven't figured it out by now. Sarah Lynn, would you read us a passage? Sure. Why not? This, um, this passage is in, as the guests come to the party and they arrive in this beautiful country mansion. And Preston is the charismatic but obnoxious playboy, the former secretary of the treasury, and he's bringing his fourth trophy wife, Nicole, to this party, and no one has met her yet. They've just been married a few months, and he met her at the Lamborghini <laughs> dealership where he bought his car. Of course. Um, he doesn't realize that Margot, his first love, and the woman that he jilted at the altar many years ago is going to be coming to this party with Les and Libby, who is her sister. So he finds that out in this passage. And another character that you're going to meet is Marshall. And Marshall is uh, the president of the Fe Federal Reserve Bank. He has a particular reason for hating Preston, and you'll you find that to, out. Yeah, you don't have to go into that. There's so many reasons. Oh, my gosh, every single person. I wanted to kill him. <laughs> I did, too, but when I killed him, I was really sad. <laughs> so um, everyone is gathering for this party, and here we have Preston and Nicole coming into the house. As Preston and Nicole entered the house, the friendly chatter around the fireplace stopped abruptly as if an in invisible conductor had signaled for silence. Simultaneously, the Thelonious Monk piece on the stereo entered a quieter movement. Marshall sat up straighter as he recognized the voice of his childhood neighbor and former best friend. His normally affable fixed features took on a coldness, his gray eyes fixed on his highball glass his mouth a thin, wide line. He watched as seemingly oblivious to the indoor change of climate, Caro rushed over to embrace Preston and meet his new wife. Come on in, Preston, and you must be Nicole, she said in her most welcoming voice. We're so glad you could come. Everyone's visiting in the family room, so take off your coats and come on in. Marshall stared out the window at the gray landscape. The wind had kicked up and the flurries had become full-fledged flakes. He tried to compose himself, but as Preston entered the room, all Marshall could think was that Preston looked like a coral snake, full of eye appeal, but deadly. I can hardly bear to be in the same room with him. Preston smiled, showing dimples, and the new veneers he had spent time and money acquiring. He greeted everyone as if there hadn't been a shred of animosity, jealousy, greed, or tragedy in their shared past. Hi, everyone. This is my wife, Nicole. I've told her all about you, and she's been looking forward to meeting my old friends. If you told her the truth, Marshall said silently, she wouldn't even have dared to come. Boy, she looks like a cheerleader. If she only knew what that old bastard is really like, she'd dump him for sure. A caterer entered with a tray of hot canopies as the bartender took more drink orders. Preston settled into a chair by the window, framed by the now thickly falling snow. Nicole perched on the chair's arm, her shiny blonde hair swinging behind her cashmere-clad sweater. Preston looked around at the group. So how's everybody doing? 
Are we still all in the 1% club? How obnoxious, Marshall thought, especially after you convinced my parents to let you tie up their money while I was in Vietnam. If I hadn't gone into business with John E., I'd still be treading water every treading water financially, thanks to you. Preston, must you start every conversation with a reference to money? People like you are the ones who give one percenters a bad name. Okay, Marshall, Preston switched topics. How's your golf game? Still holding on to my single digit handicap. Played Pebble Beach in October. Sudden death playoff on the 18th hole, Marshall replied. Sudden death, Preston repeated. That's one phrase I just hate to think about. <laughs> we'll stop there. <laughs> That's good. So he doesn't die until, I want to say, page 96, <laughs> which does a lot to draw out the tension because we know, we know he's going to die. And so you're just, you're always waiting for that moment. Is that page in the book, does, does that have to do with any kind of format or suggestion for a murder mystery? Like when should the person die? Or how did you decide that that's when it would happen? It usually happens earlier. You know, the, the traditional mystery has the death. Sometimes it happens before the book even starts. Oh. So not, page 94 is pretty late for that to happen. And there's a rule in creative writing that you should start the book at the last possible moment, uh, you know, that's possible to tell your story. And so that could be construed as a criticism that I waited too long to kill him off. But I had to do it because his personality is so central to the entire book. And everyone's relationships, he's like a hub for the whole 1% group. And everyone's relationships go to him. And even after he dies, they're thinking about him and talking about him and, and reminiscing about him. And so he's a, I had to build him up as the strong force that he is. And it took me that long to do it. Yeah, no, so I gave no. myself permission. You, you did, and again, like I said, it adds to the tension, I thought. Can we, can we talk about what it was that killed him and how you found out about that? I don't know if you want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about it. Um, pa palytoxin? Palytoxin? Polytoxin. 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 How did you find that? And it's <laughs> horrifying. It is. Um, I knew that I didn't want to. I, I faint when I see blood. It's why I didn't go into medicine. And I couldn't, here I have this beautiful character. He's so good looking and charming, albeit obnoxious. Um, but I couldn't just have him all blooded up and mucked up. So I didn't want to have him shot or stabbed or anything violent. I wanted him to have a clean, neat death. So I knew it had to be a poison. I went and bought this book called Deadly Doses. Okay. It's, it's written for the authors. It's a writer's guide to poisons. And every chapter of the book is a different poison. And it tells you every single thing you would ever want to know about how to administer, what the dose should be, what the um, effects are on a person, how much, uh, how long it takes where this can be found, how it can be processed, every single thing you would want to know. It made my husband a little nervous that I was going through this book. That's a little so, scary, frankly. Yeah. So I went through it with a highlighter and I was looking for a poison that would fit the parameters of my party and the four-story house and the a short amount of time and how it would be administered. And I was thinking about a variety of ways that it could be administered. Anyway, I got through the whole book and I couldn't find anything. Just not even one poison that would work. 
Oh, no. So I said to my writer's group, I think I may have to abandon this book because I don't have a murder weapon. And it, I was just at a stalemate. So I have a few friends who are doctors, and I thought maybe they would find something in a medical journal or something that they would have access to that normal lay people wouldn't have. And I asked them to be on the lookout for poisons. And I had two of them that came back to me, and one of them brought me polytoxin, which had just come out in the news. This is a naturally occurring poison that is a, an offshoot of the respiration of coral. So it is, it is, it's been with us for centuries, and it's been killing people for centuries, and there are no apparent side effects. You know, there, it's not like everyone just thought they had a heart attack. It was never identified as a poison until very recently. And at the time that I wrote the book, it had only appeared in two places. And this is the first book that has it as a murder weapon. So since then, though, a lot of people have been poisoned by polytoxin. And every time it makes the news, my email box is flooded with emails. Look, your poison is in the news again. Oh my God. <clears throat> have, you, have you contacted the Deadly Doses people to have them add this? Uh, no, but th I guess that's a good idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> Do it. it, so it went, and it worked out perfectly for the book. It just, it fit in exactly the, for what I was looking for. And people out there, if you have coral type um, terrar uh, aquariums, aquariums, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> look, look this up. Look, this, this is really a scary thing. I was horrified mm -hmm. that to know that it was one, a real thing. One of the people in my writer's group has aquaria, a couple of aquaria. And uh, he said, you've scared me half, half to death. And he said, and I have coral up on my wall. I'm like, well, I think that's dead and I don't think it's respiring, so. Right, it's just such a bizarre thing. And for it to be true and real, that was fascinating. That's, that's really fun that you found that and the way that you found it. Um, in an interview with Happy Ever After, uh, back in February of 2018, you talked about employing what-if thinking. Did you use that with this book? Murder Absolutely. In the 1%? Give me an example of how you were able to use what-if thinking. Um, there are examples all the way through it. What if... The, there was a party. What if there was a murder in, in bucolic Brandywine Valley? What if a rich person would risk his whole um, life, his whole status in the community to kill someone? What if that would happen? Um, there are a lot of what ifs all the way through. And then do you, as you're doing this, as you're doing this thinking, do you keep a notebook where you write down, this could happen, this could happen? Or how do you, how do you put it no. into practice? No? That would be too much like outlining. And, I, and it's funny because in my other life, I'm a great outliner. I'm, you should see my calendar is color-coded and my closet is color-coded. And I'm a very organized person in every other way. But when I'm writing a book, I... I really need for it to be spontaneous and um, I need to leave myself open for something new to come in that I haven't thought about before. And if I were to write from an outline, I think I would, I would be bored with it. And if I was bored with it, then my readers would be bored. I am so, so I, happy to hear that right now, specifically today, because I've been stuck on a, a nonfiction book I'm writing right now. And a good friend of mine, Carol Bellhouse, who's also an author, read my prologue. And she said, I know why you're stuck. She said, you, you, you're stuck on the outline. So don't do an outline, just start writing. And I felt like I could fly. I've hated outlines since I was in grade school. Mm -hmm. It's very liberating not to have an outline because you can go anywhere. 
And yeah. my husband is a, a big outliner. He's not a writer, but he, he has experimented with writing. And he sat down to outline a book that he was going to write. And he was writing it all in paragraphs. And I said, what's the difference between your outline and, and the book itself? You might as well be writing the book. So I, we have this ongoing kind of battle about to outline, to outline or not to outline. But I think a book needs to be, a fiction book needs to be organic. And it just needs to unfold. And if you get yourself into trouble, which is, he warns me all the time, you paint yourself into a corner. And that does happen. But you can paint yourself out. Absolutely. You know. You also mentioned that memorable writing, you wanted to, to create memorable writing that makes a difference in readers' lives. What difference did you hope to make in the lives of readers of your book, Murder? Well, one of the things I tried to do was show that we should not paint, every, paint people with broad brushes because I think that's one of the problems we have in society today is we'll say, oh, everybody who's in the 1% is blah, 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 this way. And they aren't. They're, they're as different as people who are in the bottom 1%. And so I try to show that there are various uh, ways that you can acquire wealth and various attitudes that you can have towards your acquired wealth. And, uh, Wealth doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. So I tried to incorporate that into the story and and hopefully people will not be so quick to judge not just the 1%, but others too. Um, there are a lot of contrasts between the people who are solving the murder, the detectives and the, the coroner and those people and the people who are involved in this murder. And I tried to show through the, the way they ate differently and dressed differently and thought differently, um, but they're still people. And there are crossover similarities too among those people. So um, those are some of the things that, that I tried to do beyond entertaining. Well, you did them all really well from my perspective. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. In another interview with Women Writers, Women's Books, you mentioned someone challenging you on your ability to write from a male detective's perspective. And when I read that, I just thought, really? Really? How, Today? How, <laughs> you're questioning anyone's ability to write from a different gender's perspective? How do you respond to that? It, well, for Parrot, it wasn't just a gender, it was a different race. And so the person was like, how can you possibly get into the head of an African-American male? And I said, it's just really easy for me. Um, I worked with a lot of young, young people, young men and young women in the school. I was in an urban school in Chicago, and there were, there are a lot of people that are kind of an amalgam of parrot mm -hmm. and um, just wonderful, wonderful people who are making their way in the world and doing a good job of it. And so I felt that I knew them well enough that I knew what their emotions are. And I've asked some of them who have now read the book, does parrot seem real to you? It, does he seem like an authentic character and coming from the same kind of situation that you do. And they've all said, yes, that you nailed him. So that, that means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with criticism? And again, you have fabulous reviews, but how do you deal with criticism, especially if it's not constructive? Because not all criticism is constructive. I think that there are some pitfalls of having readers do reviews um, because they're not professional reviewers and they don't always um, they don't always express 
their ideas in a constructive way or even in a professional way. And so some of those reviews really can sting and some of them I think are mean spirited and um, designed to, you know, harm the author. I think that there, you know, there are people who like to do that. Uh, take a shot and do it anonymously. Trolls, you know, it, we, we call them trolls, right? Mm -hmm. Or throw a rock and hide their hand. And I, I just had to learn to ignore those. I mean, that's all you can do, really. If, as a teacher, if you have bad behavior, one of the things that you can do is ignore the bad behavior in order to extinguish it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sort of feel that everyone is entitled to his or her opinion. And if, if the book doesn't resonate with someone, I understand that because I, I read a lot. And there are a lot of books that don't resonate with me. Um, but I, I guess I just can't cry over it. I don't want to take it to heart and have it um, destroy the joy that I'm having with this book. And, and of course, we're, we're always told as authors, don't ever respond to a negative review, say, on Amazon. Just, just mm -hmm. don't. Because people if they are in fact trolls and just out to, I don't know, be mean, be mean, mean spirited, then that would just fuel their fire. So mm -hmm. you just, as you, you're smart to just let it go and ignore it. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice might you have for aspiring murder mystery writers? Because you're, you're obviously a well-established murder mystery writer right now with Murder in the 1%, which is, again, getting great reviews and is a fun, fun read. Well, I teach creative writing. So one of my maxims that I tell my students, I give them assignments each, each session, is that they must have fun while they're writing. That's a requirement. So whatever, however you're doing it, I don't want you to, feel frustrated. I don't want you to feel obligated. I just want you to have fun. Sit down and have fun with your imagination. Let it go. Let it run. And, and so I would say to um, aspiring mystery writers to do the same. And I think it's important to read other mysteries and know the craft that goes into mysteries, but not to be constrained by other mysteries either, because you're not writing their book, you're writing your book, you're telling your story. So if, if another mystery has five suspects and you only have four, that's okay. Or if you have a few too many characters, you know, you, you might be able to make that work. So, um, I think you need to have a knowledge base of what the genre is, but I don't think you should um, feel that you're writing someone else's book. That you That's can be great. original. That's great advice, and I wish I had you as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to have you in my class. I mean, I would learn a lot from you too. <laughs> well, thank you. Your next book. A palette for love and murder, I'm hearing, is coming out in, next year sometime? Mm -hmm. In January. Is this going to be a whole new cast of characters? No. It's a sequel to Murder in the 1%. Oh. It, it's Parrot's next case. And it's in Brandywine Valley. So um, there... There are some things, if you're not familiar with Philadelphia, there are some things about this area that uh, play into the sequel. So you have met the horse crowd and the people who, um, they raise horses, they ride horses, they hunt with horses. There's this whole community of horse loving people. And, and this is out in the country. But there is also an art community there. And uh, Andrew Wyeth and his family, his father and his, his children and grandchildren are part of that community. There's a wonderful art museum, the Brandywine River Museum. 
So there's a whole artist colony there. They gather there because it's a place of great natural beauty and wonderful light. And so they're able to do their painting there and, and have colleagues, you know, and network with each other. So the art community and the horse community don't really mix that much. They have their separate interests and their separate reasons for being there. So this next case starts off with an art heist that quickly turns to murder. Oh, I love it. Is it, it's done? It's ready to go. It's ready to go. It'll, it'll come out January 25th. Why do we have to wait till January 25th? <laughs> it, well, it has to be edited. Editing is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any shout outs you want to give other than to Black Opal Books, which is your publisher? A publisher. I have a wonderful publicist who is Caitlin Hamilton Marketing. Um, and there's just a huge number of people uh, who are booksellers, uh, bookstore owners, uh, book club people. I, I know I'm gonna leave somebody out. I'm, I'm trying to list all the people. Um, people who have had me on their, their blogs, People have had me on their radio shows. Um, well, maybe you can send me a list <laughs> and I'll have links to those in my show notes after the fact. We could do that. Okay. That's All great. Right. I mean, I, I'm just totally grateful to every single person that I've met and especially to readers. It, it, that's one of the fun things about writing mysteries is that in no other genre are you so connected author and reader because you're both involved in this intricate plot with clues and red herrings and characterizations and and it's an intellectual puzzle and it's an emotional puzzle that you're doing together so every time i have a reader who's responding to the book it, it's a complete thrill all over again yeah i understand that sarah Lynn, how can people get in touch with you I have a website. It's sarahlynrichard.com. I have a presence on social media on LinkedIn and Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, um, Instagram. I think that's all of them. Right. <laughs> and uh, I'm easy to get in touch with. And I do do book clubs all over the country. And um, also I travel I've been doing a tour with Murder in the 1% awesome. to various and, places. And book clubs are wonderful places. Yesterday afternoon, I Skyped into a book club in Virginia. I live in Leadville, Colorado, but um, it was my children's old elementary school. The teachers and retired teachers, they had a book club meeting and I Skyped into it and we had a blast talking about my the novel I wrote about, about writing. So so many opportunities for, for us to be able to do that. And, mm -hmm. and so book clubs out there, don't hesitate to contact authors you're reading because we can do that in a jiffy and it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah Lynn Richard, author of Murder in the 1%. Thank you very much for visiting with Alligator Preserves today. Go read her book if you're looking for a really tricky, fun puzzle. Really looking forward to your next book and uh, best of luck on this one. Still. Thank you so much, Laurel. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. You as well. Bye.